Okay. Hi, folks, and welcome to Ancient Medicine, uh, the online version. I hope this finds you well and that you're taking care of your families and practicing good social distancing etiquette and that uh, you're being prudent as prudent can be. So here is some stuff to take your mind off the pandemic. Not very far off your mind, but, you know, a little bit. Uh, so let me see if I can turn off my floating head. You've seen me. Hi. All right, we're done. And now we're just going to talk. Before we get to Galen, I want to pause for a minute and go through our Roman authors so far, uh, something that tends to cause confusion, especially as we're looking down the barrel of the midterm, is which authors we've read are Greek and which authors we've read are Roman. Uh, that's puzzling a bit because it's also unclear sometimes. As soon as Romans are interacting with Greeks, there's a lot of crossover, a lot of uh, intersectional identities. But here are our authors for the Roman section of the course. We start with Cato the Elder, who, well, is the elder, but also the eldest of our Roman and Latin language authors here. He lives from 234 to 149 BCE, and he wrote De Agricultura, the didactic poem that is like a teaching poem on agriculture. Why, you may ask, are we reading a book about agriculture for medicine? Well, Cato represents this kind of Roman medicine that existed before the widespread adoption of Greek-style medicine and Greek-style doctors. This isn't to say that he wasn't aware of Greeks. Uh, Cato went to college in Athens, as did his son. He, he knew of the Hippocratic corpus and had a, a handle on what Greek medicine could have to offer. His big political push was to insist that Romans speak Latin and that Romans maintain a distance from Greek culture, Greek research, and Greek knowledge. To that end, his On Agriculture includes both advice for how to farm your land with enslaved labor and also medical advice that represents uh, Italian folk medicine and the kind of stuff that folks were using before upper class Romans began to read medical authors and to hire Roman or rather Greek speaking doctors. Traditionally speaking, it was the male head of household, the pater familias' duty to oversee health care for his family. Uh, family here isn't just people who are related to you. It's you, your enslaved folks, your freedmen, um, everybody except your wife most of the time. Your wife belonged to her father's family. All right, so that's Cato. If you're trying to place his content in your mind, this is the fellow who's very fond of cabbage. This is an ancient portrait bust, um, the image on this slide of a, some Roman guy. We don't have a firm identification, but it's often listed as a portrait of Cato the Elder. However, probably not. But he looks like you'd expect Cato to look, which is, I think, why that's gotten to be a bit of a thing. Um, below also, some astute internet person photoshopped him into a cabbage which is hilarious if you've done the reading. So if you haven't, treat yourself because Cato, uh, Cato has some very interesting advice. Um, I think we mentioned this last time we met as a class. This is uh, stick up your butt to prevent the chub rub guy. Next up, a good century later, really 150 years, we have Aulus Cornelius Celsus. We don't know a ton about this author other than this reading existing and his name and the authorship. We're not even sure if his first name is Aulus, but we'll just go with that. Celsus, sometimes you'll hear him pronounce Celsus. I prefer the hard C, that's how it works in Latin. The De Medicina, his On Medicine, was part of a four-volume series on the sciences in the ancient world. 
military science, agricultural science, I think a, another one was on rhetoric, and then the on medicine. Now, the other three have been lost. The only thing we have left from Kelsis is his on medicine, because it's just so gosh darn useful. Although Kelsus is a Latin speaker, he's writing in Latin, he likely identified as Roman, the scholarship he's using to write his On Medicine is pulled from Alexandrian research and authors. He's one of our main sources for Herophilus and Erisistratus, and the kinds of surgical procedures he describes seem to have their basis in surgical research in Alexandria. It was a classic for ages. It's never been out of print. This was the go-to surgical manual of the Middle Ages, both in the Latin and the Arab-speaking worlds. It's a super influential book. We're not going to be spending as much time with it now. We're instead going to focus on Celsus when we talk about surgery in the ancient world but this is a useful timeline, so I'm putting him in here. Slightly by two years younger than Celsus is Pliny the Elder, who is my ancient best friend. I love this guy so, so much, and you'll have to pardon me because I, I have a hard time not talking about him too much. So Pliny the Elder is the author of many, many works, only one of which survives. His earliest work was on cavalry tactics. He wrote a grammar manual, uh, some history works. But this that we're going to visit with a bit in this class is his most impressive contribution to scientific writing. And it is huge. There's no way we can read even a fraction of his natural history because it's 37 books long. And these books are very, very long books. Just to give you some perspective, Pliny the Elder still takes up an entire shelf on the library if you go to see him in the, the Kuhn library. Don't though, because social distancing is important. Also, Pliny the Elder is available on the internet. If you Google him and ignore all of the beer ads, you'll run into him. There's a beer named after him, by the way, and if you Google him, you'll see that too. Pliny the Elder doesn't give us beer recipes. What he does is he maybe possibly mentions hops once, sort of. Uh, it's a really tenuous connection, but it's a fancy craft beer. I hear folks like it. Um, I have a sulfide allergy, so beer and I are a no-go. What you should remember Pliny the Elder for is that he is a nerd hero. He had an active military career until the reign of Nero, who, amongst the many reasons to hate him because he was just a shitty human being and not a particularly good governor either, uh, the Emperor Nero decided that Pliny the Elder and his circle of military officials were um, not trustworthy, probably sketchy, and maybe plotting against him. So Pliny had to take a hiatus from his military service, and that might have been when he started writing the natural history, although the first thing he writes and publishes during this period is his work on grammar. He served with Corbulo and perhaps also Vespasian, we do know that he and Vespasian were very close, so that when Vespasian overthrows Nero, more or less, it's complicated. Look up the year of four emperors if you're interested in how this pans out. Pliny the Elder's dude and army buddy, Vespasian, got to be emperor, and then Pliny was called back to service. In 79 CE, the year that he died, he was stationed at the Bay of Naples, the Roman naval base in Mycenaeum was the major naval base defending Rome. Rome's own port, Ostia, wasn't able to handle the kind of uh, deep draft boats that you would need, so they put that in the Bay of Naples. To be the commander in Mycenaeum is a massive honor. Uh, Pliny if you asked him to describe his life's work um, among friends, he'd probably mention the military service first. So it is 
still more remarkable that while he was commanding the largest and most important naval base in the Roman world, he also worked in all of his spare time on the natural history, which is what we'll be reading bits of. The natural history was his attempt to give you a one-stop shop for the state of the art of scientific knowledge in the first century CE. And he wrote, read just an amazing amount of literature for his literature literature review. And unlike many ancient authors, he cites his sources pretty reliably. Because of Pliny the Elder, we have preserved bits and pieces from scientists that otherwise would be lost. One of them is Juba of Mauritania, Mauritania's modern Morocco. He was a, an African king allied with Rome. And also he married Cleopatra's daughter, Cleopatra Cellini. So he's super interesting, if only for that. But he too was a scientific author and politician like most Hellenistic kings. He wrote on animal behavior, especially that of the elephant, mapping and geography. And the only reason we know that Juba wrote anything is that he's in Pliny the Elder. Similarly, most of the women authors we have from the ancient world, we have because Pliny the Elder used them in his research and cited his sources. This includes uh, Laius, Elephantis, Cleopatra the pharmacologist, um, Cleopatra is a really common woman's name in Greek, and Sotir the physician, Matrodora the gynecologist. If it weren't for Pliny the Elder, we wouldn't even know these women's names. So the the fact that this book exists is our last link to the many, like not a huge number, but th there is a pretty decent amount of women scientists in the ancient world, which is so cool, amongst all the other things that are cool about Pliny the Elder. But he himself did a little bit of firsthand poking around. Anytime he was stationed anywhere in the empire, he took notes and used it to evaluate his sources. So he's a researcher too. Now, the only way he was able to write this massive work while simultaneously holding down a full-time job, and also he had a career on the side as a logger, like this guy was a machine, but also, and here's where it gets a little less wholesome, he had a large enslaved secretarial pool. So what you're reading is not just Pliny the Elder's writing, but it's a collaboration between Pliny and a sizable staff, and we know this because his nephew and heir wrote a description of his working methods. So this is one of the only authors in the ancient world for whom we know their research process. So what he'd do is whenever he had a spare moment, when he was traveling, when he was waiting for court cases to come out of recess, uh, when he was in the bath, when he was eating dinner, um, when he was up in the middle of the night, he had really bad insomnia. Then he would have one of his enslaved secretaries read to him, and then he'd have another secretary there to take his notes while he's reading, and then this would create this bank of notes, and then he'd work on it later with his secretarial pool to collate, compile, and put it into a whole. So the result of this collaboration, the natural history, goes from the shape of the cosmos and the sky through man as an animal to all of the other animals. Uh, Pliny has this idea that human beings aren't separate from the rest of the animal kingdom, that we're an animal too, and this means that animals have souls and personalities and habits and culture. He's just a, a delightful observer of that. He also writes on, let's see, geography, astronomy, mineralogy, uh, geology, natural phenomena, um, and then book after book after book after book on remedies. Now, a casual acquaintance with Pliny the Elder will suggest that he was just a shitty medical scientist. He does record a lot of cures that are pretty out there. For instance, there's this one place where he says uh, rabid dog bites can be cured with roses. No, that's not how you cure rabies. Uh, he also suggests that if you apply an ointment to the rabid dog bite, 
made from a hair of the tail of the dog that bit you, which is where we get the phrase hair of the dog is from Pliny's rabies cure. This isn't a great rabies cure. However, he spends a lot of time talking about unscrupulous alternative medicine and magical cures. He pushes back really hard at the magi particularly, but also for medical practitioners who charge unreasonable fees and use their position of trust to financially abuse their patients. So he's one of the first advocates for affordable and accessible health care. And he's also really interested in educating his reader about good science and good medicine. How do you know a good cure? He is passionately committed to giving you cures that are affordable, accessible, and that work not just for educated elite Romans, but for anyone. And a lot of the medical information he gives you is meant to keep you from being taken in by predatory doctors. Now, this doesn't mean that Pliny the Elder is super woke. He's an ancient Roman. And there are limits. And he was a pretty committed imperialist, but he's also one of the oldest writers to passionately argue for environmental sustainability. Uh, ecology shows up everywhere in the natural history. He talks about soil depletion, the loss of foresting, irresponsible agricultural product processes, uh, littering, toxicity, waste, uh, mine refuse. And he's also very adamant that human lives shouldn't be expended in the search for resources. He talks a lot about the ethics of buying pearls when pearl farmers regularly died from diving to get the oysters from the bottom of the seabed. Uh, he wrote about mine safety and miners' lives. He's an early advocate not just for workers' rights, but also for affordable health care and environmental sustainability. I love this guy. Um, while being horrified at the whole, like, owning enslaved people thing. And not so much on board with the imperialism thing, but, you know, ancient people are problematic. Now, this in and of itself is sufficient reason to find Pliny the Elder just a fantastic source and a great person. But he also had the best death in the ancient world. So, AD 79, in Mycenaeum, that's the Bay of Naples. Naples, Italy is also where Pompeii and Herculaneum are. You see where I'm going with this. So one day in 79, uh, the date is debated, so I won't pin it down, either in August or September, depending. Mount Vesuvius went from being a mountain to being a topless ash cloud blower. We know this from Pliny's nephew. Uh, he was 17 at the time, and he was staying with his uncle and his mom, um, Pliny's sister, Plinia. Pliny the Elder himself never married and never had a romantic part partner at all, as far as we know. He had no biological children, which is why he adopted his nephew as his heir. So uh, as well as being a geek icon, Pliny the Elder might also be an early asexuality icon, too. He's my ancient best friend. You'll just have to forgive me. Actually, don't. Pliny is awesome. Anyway, 79, Vesuvius blows its top. Pliny goes to the window, sees the eruption in progress, and he starts making plans to go check it out from a closer angle. He asks his nephew if his nephew wants to come with, and then Pliny the Younger tells his uncle, um, yeah, I'd love to, but I've got to do my homework, so I'm going to stay here. Bless his heart. Now, about this time, Pliny starts getting messages from panicked citizens along the coast in the Bay of Naples begging for rescue. And at this point, Pliny's scientific mission now turns into a rescue mission. He calls up the ships at Mycenaeum, including his flagship, and he organizes very quickly a party to sail across the Bay of Naples to Stabiae, which is the closest port to Pompeii and Herculaneum and other towns around the bay, partly to save um, 
his friend, I think her name is Richilia or something, um, his other friend Pomponianus meets him at the beach. Pomponianus had a library, so Pliny wants to rescue people, but he's also in rescuing the libraries of Pompeii because this was a wealthy playground for a lot of Roman civil servants like Pliny, and he knew where all the good books were and was really worried that they'd get hurt in the eruption. Now, once they arrive at Stabia, they realize that the prevailing winds are blowing inshore. So while it was very easy to sail towards the eruption, sailing away from the eruption is much more difficult. By now, ash is falling on the boats. They have to continuously move it off of the decks so that the boats don't sink. So what Pliny does at this point, um, when he sailed, he told his men, fortune favors the brave, let's go. He now can't leave, so he stays the night at his friend Pomponianus' house while serving as the nerve center of the rescue operation. So people are being loaded onto the boats, he's preparing for the winds to shift, and if not, because these Roman warships can be uh, moved by oars, then he's going to row out. Now, on the next day, as the refugees were climbing onto the boat, including Pliny, he collapses because he himself had chronic underlying health conditions. He was one of the people who was particularly vulnerable in an eruption or indeed in any other kind of disaster scenario. So he has an asthma attack. He may have also had a heart attack secondary to the asthma attack. Um, other people were still able to breathe, so it wasn't uh, toxic fumes at the same level that killed people, say, on the beach at Herculaneum. So Pliny tries to make it to the boat. Two of his aides try to hold him up, but he's just overcome, and they leave him on the beach so as to save his space for more of the evacuees from Pompeii. They come back later, and they see that his body's still there on the beach, almost like it's sleeping, but he's gone, he's dead. Uh, side note about this, you may have seen news items popping up about uh, whether or not we've discovered the skull of Pliny the Elder. That's probably not Pliny the Elder's skull, and I'm so sorry, I really want it to be. I'm that kind of a fangirl, I would just love to have it, but because the body was found by his nephew, it's inconceivable, well, almost inconceivable, that his nephew would leave the body there and not take it home and bury it. Like, that's that would have been an actionable faux pas that no self-respecting Roman would do. It's, uh, yeah, it's not how they roll. And that's the death of Pliny the Elder. Now, it's not quite the end, though, because this kind of eruption that happened at Vesuvius, where you have a sudden explosion and a cloud that hangs in the air and subsequently collapses in a pyroclastic flow, it wasn't that Romans didn't know that volcanoes existed and that eruptions happen. Like, Stromboli's right there in Sicily. They've seen volcanoes, but they didn't know that this kind of volcano existed, uh, one that suddenly explodes after periods of dormancy. This kind of eruption had a name, and we still call it a Plinian eruption, after Pliny the Elder and also his nephew Pliny the Younger, who wrote down an account of the, the incident. And that's Pliny the Elder. He's a geek icon, a science hero, and one of the most delightfully wholesome authors to come out of the ancient world. I, I just, I love him to death. He's fantastic. No, I'm not overselling this. You should totally treat yourself to Pliny. Okay. On to our next author. That's Galen of Pergamum. I, I'm not nearly as much of a scholar fangirl for Galen as I am for Pliny, but Galen also deserves your respect and attention because he is, among all of these names, except for maybe Pliny, the most influential to come out of this lineup. Now, about mm, a century or so after Pliny the Elder was active, Galen of Pergamon becomes the physician to the emperor, then Marcus Aurelius. 
we'll be talking about him today. He's the actual topic of this lecture. More about him coming up, but the treatise I'm having you read for this week to get to know Galen is On Prognosis. On Prognosis is going to make for a better read if you keep in mind that ancient literature like Galen's was meant to be performed. So it's like looking at the transcript of somebody's podcast or poetry slam. It's meant also to be a little bit of an infomercial because the thing that starts happening in medicine under the Roman Empire is that doctors compete for who gets to be the physician to the most powerful Roman. And they do this by actively competing with each other in public demonstrations and also by having intellectual debates and dogfights, really, at the bedside of sick Roman dudes. More about that later. We've also read something else from the Roman period. The Digest of Roman Law is the source that I got the things we were reading when we were talking about the doctrine Roman law. Now, those laws date from the first century BC to the third century CE. It's a really widespread. It was compiled in 533 CE in an attempt to standardize Roman law. And if you remember anything from Law Day, you can see why they might need some standardization. So the internally contradictory Roman laws we were reading are after they tried to make everything consistent, which gives you some idea of just how chaotic the Roman legal system could be. And that's that. So on to the specifics for Galen. In Galen's day, Greek medicine had become pretty well integrated with Roman culture. So by now, most Romans accept that medicine is studied in an academic sense in the Greek language. You only see people writing medical information in Latin if they're trying to reach a broader, more popular audience, and if they themselves don't self-identify as a professional physician. For those who were professional physicians, especially professional physicians for high profile clients, they are literate, they're working in the Greek language, and they're instructed in Greek and expected to read Greek language literature from the past couple of centuries, beginning with the Hippocratic corpus. Now, I mentioned briefly this uh, self promotion trend in the time of Galen. And the art that you're looking at now is a woodcut from an early modern edition of Galen showing a bunch of Romans sitting around watching this pig dissection or vivisection. It's unclear. Let's call it a dissection. That's a little bit less uh, depressing. But if you look in the back, they're labeled uh, Barbarus, Boethus, Paulus, Severus. All of these guys show up in prognosis, uh, as does Eudemos, so the dude who's standing right behind Galen. His name's cut off a bit, but it says Eudem. Uh, that's one of Galen's friends and possibly colleagues. Galen name drops a lot, so we have a really good idea of how he fit into the patronage system. On prognosis is dedicated to a Roman who was very likely one of Galen's patrons, uh, Eudemus, and then Boethus eventually becomes another of Galen's patrons. Galen climbs the patronage ladder until finally he's the imperial physician, at which point the emperor becomes his patron. This includes a deal for Roman citizenship, most likely. Uh, I don't think Galen ever mentions that he has Roman citizenship, but it's very likely that he did. So this is Galen giving one of his anatomical demonstrations. The modern article that I've had you read for the Galen section, Maud Gleason's Shock and Awe, tells you more about these anatomical demonstrations. This was an outgrowth of a larger intellectual and entertainment movement in the Roman world uh, we call sometimes the second sophistic period, wherein Greek public speakers would fill an auditorium who would come to see them orate extemporaneously, usually on some kind of a historical scenario. It looks a lot like what we've been doing in class with our little uh, 
ancient hypothetical stories. So they'd give speeches that were um, fan fiction based on the Peloponnesian War sometimes, sometimes the Persian Wars too. Within that then, doctors also began to fill stadiums with audiences, but instead of giving public speaking demonstrations, they would give anatomy demonstrations where they would dissect and vivisect animals for the audience. Uh, vivisection, if you didn't know, is to dissect something while the subject is still alive. Along with that, I feel it's necessary to give you a heads up about the content. One of the things we'll be reading coming up is Galen's On Anatomical Procedures. I've given you the full text in just a few sections to read. One of them does include explicit descriptions of uh, violence to animals, and I've marked it so that you can skip it if it's too much for you. I'm very sympathetic. I have this weird double standard where human death upsets me less than animal death. It's not rational, but there we are. I just uh, can't stand it when the puppy dies. At any rate, Galen's anatomical procedures is meant to be his um, do-it-yourself guide to how to run an anatomical demonstration. So he's imagining that the reason why you're practicing dissection or vivisection is so that you can go out and do it in front of an audience so that you can get Romans to be your clients. He talks about not just this performance art of dissection, but also a social dynamic in which he would call out members of the audience to come and make guesses about um, what will happen if I cut this nerve, or hey, what do you think's under this muscle? And he'd also challenge his medical rivals to come up and stop the bleeding sometimes. There was one particular where he would cut a major artery, challenge another doctor out of the audience to come up and stop the bleeding, and at least according to Galen, this usually ended in the other doctor not being able to do it, and then Galen would swoop in at the last minute and tie off the bleeder, thus effectively defeating his competition and demonstrating his badassery as a doctor. This was a thing for longer than you might think it would be. Victorians were still doing surgical demonstrations in operating theaters well into the early 1900s, and in some older medical schools you'll still be able to find theater venues that are made for surgeons to do um, live performance surgery. Now a note about vivisection. Uh, we've talked a little bit about how there's some debate over whether or not Herophilus or Erisistratus did human vivisection or not. By this period, dissections and vivisections are mostly all animals. Now this is not to say, and sometimes you'll hear this, which is why I'm bringing it up, also, it's a question on your midterm and the check-in quiz. So here, here you go. Re-human cadaver dissection in the ancient world. While human vivisection was by now considered inappropriate, human dissection on human cadavers did happen, just not in any systematic way. When you went to medical school, you weren't provided with a cadaver. It wasn't a regular part of medical education partly because there were some protection on the kinds of people who were considered acceptable to dissect. And this had to do with beliefs about burial, not necessarily laws though. Um, Wikipedia, I think, still claims that there's some law in 150 BCE that outlaws human cadaver dissection and then nobody ever does it again. A, that's not how law works, yes? Just because you make weed illegal doesn't mean that people aren't going to smoke weed. Just because you make cadaver dissection illegal doesn't mean that it's going to work any more than making murder illegal makes murder stop. Rather, what's happening is a social dynamic. Because the most powerful patients in this marketplace are really worried that their doctors are secretly experimenting on them and doing unethical things with their bodies, and doctors are trying to allay those kinds of suspicions and fears, 
then doctors are avoiding at least openly admitting to dissecting cadavers that aren't in a category of people that Roman culture doesn't consider protected. Galen himself talks about an incident where a body on the war front of the Danube, this is the border between the Roman Empire and Germany, along with the emperor were some of his physicians. The emperor procured a dead German, and then the physicians tried to dissect the dead German, and Galen mocks them for really sucking at dissecting them the dead German. It's now considered a matter of scholarly probability that many, not all, but many doctors did dissect people who were, for instance, executed criminals. Uh, Galen admits to working with the body of uh, an alleged bandit who'd been found by the side of the road. He also mentions that some people used um, the bodies of dead babies who had been left on trash heaps, which is where this gets very depressing. I'm so sorry. Uh, but those bodies also were considered not protected. So anybody whose family wasn't coming to claim the body to bury it was at least nominally fair game, and it seems that doctors did sometimes poke around in them. However, there was general consensus, even among the most dissection positive doctors, Galen being one of them, that the things that we can learn from human dissection are kind of limited because there's only so much of the human body we can access for therapeutic means. And a lot of the parts that you can operate on you can figure out the details of much more easily and much more safely by using animal bodies. For this reason, animals are the go-to dissection subjects. And in fact, that's still how we work it. We train people on animal cadavers, and you don't get a human cadaver until medical school. And now medical schools are beginning to rethink the way that we source bodies, whether or not the cadaver is still a useful and necessary part of medical education. So this one's still up and open as a an ethical and practical question. Now, there's another dynamic at play, though. I haven't talked about opportunistic vivisection, and this is the time to mention it. Maud Gleason talks about this a lot. Opportunistic vivisection was something that both Roman patients and doctors working for them understood as an acceptable and indeed ethical alternative to cadaver dissection. Opportunistic vivisection is learning about anatomy in situations where bodily structures just happen to be exposed. So this is the, while I'm in there, I might as well look around a little bit approach to learning anatomy, which may strike you as an interesting ethical compromise to make, especially if it's your surgery that the doctor is poking around inside of. That's where ancient people seem to draw the line of acceptable, though. There are bits in anatomical procedures where Galen talks very openly and comfortably about doing this in ways that he's not quite as open and comfortable with when discussing cadaver dissections. For instance, uh, he talks about this plague of what he calls anthrax. It's probably not actual anthrax because anthrax doesn't do this. Uh, likely, this was an outbreak of flesh-eating streptococcus. This was in Alexandria when Galen was in med school, and he talks about one of his professors taking the med students on grand rounds to see victims of this flesh-eating strep, where he'd tell the patient to wiggle one of the fingers and then make the med students guess about which muscle is going to twitch when which finger wiggles. And that's considered an acceptable way to learn anatomy, enough that we see it being thrown around a lot. However, some ancient doctors draw the line a lot more strictly, and they say, you know, look, the things you can learn from, from anatomy are a little bit limited, this is something empiricists really push back on, and Methodists do too, and that a lot of clinical experience you get not 
from looking at the human body or animal bodies when dead, but from learning how living bodies interact and deriving best practices from treatment history. Now I'm going to say this at this part of the lecture. One of the problems that Galen introduces to us as historians of medicine, and this is a bit of a spoiler, but here you go, Galen becomes one of, if not the most authoritative author coming out of the ancient world, primarily because Galen is an almost compulsive self-publisher. He publishes versions of his notes for his medical students. He has commentaries on large portions of the Hippocratic corpus. He has pieces like On Prognosis that are essentially infomercials. He has self-help books. We're going to read his self-help book about how to manage your anger. We're also going to be looking at his exercise with a small ball, which is his trendy diet treatise. Galen wrote anything and everything. And because his patron was the emperor, his works got copied. So almost instantly, he became the backbone of any good medical library. In future years, uh, especially since there was a good deal of political turmoil in the years after Galen dies. Galen dies at about the end of a period that we sometimes refer to as the Pax Romana or the reign of the five good emperors. With the death of Commodus, Marcus Aurelius' son, the empire is plunged into a century of military coups, civil wars, short-lived emperors, I mean, you name it. It's very, very bad. And also the plague that had been simmering during the time of Antoninus Pius sweeps through Rome. So Rome is under great amounts of instability. There are plagues, there are famines, there are invasions. It, it's just very disruptive for scientific research. As you have noticed, when there's a plague on, it becomes difficult to communicate with your scholarly community, especially if you don't have, say, uh, webcams. This means that although medical research certainly was going on, that period in medical research didn't get preserved, and by the time the dust settles, Galen has become one of the most authoritative voices in medicine. And this compounds in later years, because with the rise of medical schools, first in the Arab-speaking world and later through copycatedness in the, uh, the European theater, when professors have to assign reading for their med students. They pick authors that write on a lot of topics in a consistent way, and Galen is perfect. Galen writes about just nearly everything that you need to know about medicine. The one thing we don't have a ton of Galen on is obstetrics and gynecology, and that's the only reason we still have Serranus of Ephesus. It's a spot Galen missed. Likewise, the very few texts that were written in Latin from the ancient world, those do survive because Latin becomes the dominant language of science in the Western Empire. And even after the centralized empire ceases to exist in the West, Latin still is the language in which you carry on your professional development and training. So Celsus sticks around, Pliny the Elder sticks around. It's uh, good for Scribonius Largus too. Galen survives in Latin translation until after the Crusades. Greek again becomes a language that intellectuals speak and read, so Galen again becomes dominant in the West. And because of this, a lot of people, even medical historians working in periods after the ancient period, um, well, the ancient period, the ancient period in the Mediterranean. They tend to use Galen as a spokesperson for Greco-Roman medicine. And then when they need a straw man to knock down and to dis Greco-Roman medicine, Galen makes a convenient target in some ways because he's a little reactionary in women's health. What little he does write about women's health, he decides to ignore the last five hundred years or so of medical advances and to turn back the clock to Aristotle and to go with Aristotle's gynecology because Aristotle relies on 
animal models. And Galen, although he very likely dissected humans, he probably didn't dissect human women. Uh, one side note, I forgot to mention this. Another reason why dissection and cadaver dissection wasn't necessarily a favored method of medical education, and also a reason why that's not a stupid thing, is that when a human body dies, the human body isn't immediately pickled, yeah? Human bodies are a dead body. The minute that you die, the bacteria in your gut begin to multiply and eat into your abdominal cavity, and this happens elsewhere in the body too. So that after even a few hours, but even a day later, it's, it's much, much worse, you're dealing with sharp objects around a major source of source of pathogens and if you happen to nick your finger while you're dissecting a cadaver that hasn't been preserved and sterilized that bacterial load can get right into your bloodstream and you can drop dead from septicemia very very quickly this was still a problem before the early 20th century or so it used to be a regular thing that medical students would accidentally cut themselves while dissecting their cadaver and die. There are also a lot of shenanigans about uh, body supply and procurement and ethics too. At one point in Edinburgh, this was happening in Victorian London too, there were these serial killers who made their living off of murdering people and then selling the corpses to the medical schools and they'd get a huge amount of money because their bodies were the freshest because they just murdered the dude um dudes women uh, but also children's bodies sometimes they'd get extra for children's bodies and this is still an ethical issue for medical historians because we still have preserved specimens made from bodies like this and deciding what to do with these objects is a tricky thing because these were people whose bodies are being used by science without permission or consent in really sketchy circumstances but now they're also important bits of evidence for medical history so we used to display them now we've stepped back from doing that a bit However, not all preserved specimens you see in museums are necessarily items that were procured in an unethical way. In some cases, collections were built through people who consented. The Mudder Museum is one example. So Philadelphia, the Mudder Museum, you can still feel good about going there and checking it out. Right, on to our next topic then. The world in the time of Galen. So part of what allowed Galen to write on so many topics at such great length and to have such a fruitful professional career as a medical researcher and a practitioner was the socio-political situation of the Mediterranean during his lifetime. Here we're looking at a map circa 117 CE. Uh, your map says AD. I'm calling it CE, including the Roman provinces at the time. It, you don't need to pay attention to senatorial versus imperial provinces. Everything that's in pink or in green here, or if you're colorblind, everything that is medium muddy gray and borders on the Mediterranean Sea, that's Roman provincial territory. So all of this Rome owns outright including Britain, Britain's a garrison, and then they have diplomatic contacts further still into these areas, um, including the Parthian Empire, the interior of Africa north of the Sahara. This was also a period of relative military peace. That is to say, apart from scattered border conflicts, Rome was not at civil war, and for Rome to go a century without much civil war is truly remarkable, but also a time during which the Roman military had a decent control over the roadways and sea lanes. This doesn't mean it was safe to travel, but it was safer to travel than it had been in any other period. Um, I have to put a caveat on this though. 
the very availability of traveling also made for a brisk business in human trafficking. So because the sea lanes themselves were pretty easy to tra traverse, and there was a huge amount of money in enslaved people, and Rome after 117 wasn't actively engaged in wars of conquest, the way that folks got enslaved people was either kidnapping them on the borders and shipping them into the center, Rome, Alexandria, Carthage, these major metropolitan zones, or they would kidnap people who were traveling and resell them as enslaved people. And if you were captured while traveling, you don't have your documentation proving that you're a free person and a citizen was difficult. So it's not all good news here, but relatively speaking, especially if you're from a more wealthy, upwardly mobile family, you can travel easily and you have stable modes of communication from one empire to the other. If you're a doctor, you can get pharmaceutical products from all over the place, not just from all bits of the empire, but trade routes are held open reliably and over long periods of time. This is the point at which Rome is in constant trade communication with China, and there is some record of diplomatic missions, both from the Imperial Roman court to, I think at this point it was the Qing Dynasty? Drad, you think I'd remember this. At any rate, there is communication going backwards and forwards to China. So regularly, in fact, that um, within about 200 years, that's the route of transmission of the bubonic plague for the first time from Central Asia to the Mediterranean. But that doesn't happen until the 500s under Justinian. Here, that hasn't happened yet. All of this comes together to give Galen his pretty much perfect career, he gets everything on an ancient doctor's bucket list. Ah yes, so about this Antonine Plague, um, more of the not all good news. The Antonine Plague begins around 165 and 180 is given as an end date, but it was still breaking out in bits and pieces even after this period. Antonine is named after the emperor at the first point where this plague pandemic generates. Um, this is Antoninus Pius. He's right in the middle of this period of stability with the five good emperors. It goes Nerva, then Trajan, then um, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius Commodus. Uh, Commodus, you'll notice, is name number six. Historians of the ancient, in the ancient world did not consider him good. If you've seen Gladiator, you have a general idea why. Uh, do not, however, use Gladiator as a historical source. Its version of history is fictionalized, although it's one of the better depictions of Roman globalism on the screen, actually quite like it. Anyway, back to our Antonine Plague. This first breaks out along the Danube River Valley. So the Danube border was the most conflict prone and dangerous station to be sent to if you were a Roman soldier during this period, because it's a zone where occasionally there is military action and heat as raiding parties come south of the Danube, and also fitful starts and stops as Rome keeps trying to conquer extra bits of territory. Trajan added the province of Dacia, which if you look on the map previous is just north of the Danube. This is modern day Romania, more or less. And this was a very difficult border to defend. Rome built a wall to try to control the move of people, but that wall didn't work all that great. I mean, it did make a great base of operations and Rome was able to hold this border. Now, into this situation came an outbreak of a new disease. And as Roman soldiers were sent home from the front, this disease spreads to the central Mediterranean. Also, soldiers were sent from one garrison to another. This spread the disease further. Now, what was this plague is a really great question. We used to say, uh, is, 
as recently as two, three years ago, I would be telling you that we have no idea what this and indeed most ancient plagues really are because the science just isn't there yet, clinical descriptions aren't useful, there's a lot of debate based on the symptoms of what things can or cannot be. Now, we used to think, and you'll still see this on the internet some places, that the Antonine Plague was measles. It is not measles! However, you can see why they might think that's what this is. Measles creates a rash of little red pustules, and we know little red rough pustules was part of the deal. And measles can be incredibly devastating when it's moving into a population that doesn't have a, an endemic history of the disease. Hell, if you do have an endemic history of measles, it's still a killer. Measles is bad. Get your vaccinations. Vaccinations are fantastic. Um, and if you're immunocompromised, I am so sorry. If you're not immunocompromised, get your vaccinations. However, within the past couple years, we've been able to use pathogen DNA regression to figure out the date at which measles jumped from animals to human. And this is something that's beginning to give us all kinds of information about historical epidemics. The most literature is on the bubonic plague, but there's no bubonic plague at this point. That used to be another contender for this plague. It has also been completely ruled out by, um, in that case, bacterial DNA regression. Sometimes you'll hear it called ADNA, ancient DNA. The measles pathogen became able to infect humans sometime between 500 and 900 CE. And that does fit the historical evidence as well. Our first clear description of a clinical case of measles in a human dates from around 1000 CE, and it's in uh, Maimonides. So Maimonides is a Jewish medieval physician who's working in the court and medical schools of Baghdad in modern day Iraq. Maimonides is fantastic. Alas, our timeline ends before we can spend more time with him. Uh, so measles is newer than we used to think. It's only been in the hum human population a little over a thousand years. Alas, it's still around for reasons that are stupid and short-sighted and super ableist. Back to then our other contenders. Um, bubonic plague, as I mentioned, isn't this disease. Bubonic plague doesn't hit the Mediterranean until the 500s. This might be smallpox. We don't have great evidence that we've been able to use to figure this out. One of the problems with smallpox is that it kills you so quickly that it doesn't necessarily leave evidence in dental pulp. So the way that we study pathogen DNA in human bodies is we take dental pulp, we process it to extract DNA fragments that aren't from the human host, and we match those up to known strains of pathogen DNA. Uh, viruses have DNA, bacteria have DNA, and we've gotten so good at DNA analysis that we can do this with very small samples and very degraded bodies. We're still working on smallpox regression. Now, smallpox was not necessarily new to the Mediterranean. It had been endemic in Egypt since, uh, gosh, the Ypres papyrus, so the Bronze Age, smallpox had been around, but smallpox tended to burn fast, hot, and quickly snuff out again. What might be happening here is that as a result of the greater interconnectedness of the Roman world, the greater availability of travel, and smallpox's general virulence. Uh, smallpox is a horrific disease, uh, really just gnarly. We're here looking at a patient in the early stages of smallpox, the picture on the left. After a few days, the pustules you're looking at now spread to encompass the entire surface of the skin, including inside your mouth and your nose, and then that layer of skin will blister up and slough off, leaving you with horrible pitted scars. It's just 
dreadful, which is why the minute that we could eradicate it, we did. And for now, it remains eradicated. I still really want to get cowpox uh, for the reasons that follow. Smallpox was one of the first diseases in which vaccination was studied. Indeed, we get the name vaccination for a practice that comes specifically out of immunizing people to smallpox. Because it is such a horrific disease and so prone to outbreak and act uh, epidemics. And because there are kind of low tech ways to immunize people against it, it became our first test case. Now, the first method for making people immune to smallpox, and I'm, I'm sorry, this won't be on a test. You don't have to remember this. I'm just telling you it because it's cool and it's interesting and you're learning remotely now. So this is effectively a podcast with pictures. The earliest way that you would gain immunity without developing smallpox itself was to take weakened virus from the pustule of a patient with an active infection and to put it into the uninfected person's body by scratching the skin with a pus-covered needle or blade. This practice was likely invented in India somewhere around the first millennium CE, so around the year 1000. It may have been going on earlier still. It may have also been independently developed in China. This made its way into the Mediterranean and um, on and off was used to immunize people into the 1700s. In fact, the 1700s sees some of our first historical pro-vaccination campaigns. Now, part of the resistance to variolation was due to its riskiness, because even though for most patients you would get a mild infection and then develop immunity, for some patients, um, an unacceptably large percentage by modern standards, patients would develop an actual case of smallpox. So you could die from variolation. It was not safe. It wasn't a killed virus vaccine. There was no way of standardizing or testing the reliability and strength of it. And you also couldn't keep it for long. One of the problems with vaccination that we've had to work around and solve, and we've gotten very good at this, so this is no longer something you should worry about with vaccines. But back in the day, you can't just keep living pathogens around forever. They're going to run out of food and die. So you can't just keep a jar of smallpox pus around until it looks like you're about to have an outbreak. You need to take it out of a fresh source so that it's live enough to work. This preservative problem is why for a long time we used uh, thimerosal and mercury. We no longer do. And even when we did, the amount that was in it was absolutely minuscule, nowhere near the amount that you need for toxicity. Um, it was safe. We just stopped doing it because we came up with safer ways. Uh, often, too, vaccinations were kept with multiple doses in a single vial. So putting in uh, preservatives would help you to use the same container for multiple injections without that container going bad very quickly because you opened it. At any rate, in the, I think this is the 1820s, 1830s, a physician named Edward Jenner came in contact with some dairy workers, all of them young women. And the way this story is told often, it's told like an Edward Jenner discovered Thing. And yes, he plays a role in this. But the people who first make this observation are not doctors. They're dairy workers who notice that those of them who have gotten smallpox, or not smallpox, cowpox, so this is a pox virus that's bovine specific, but also jumps to humans. It jumps to other animals too. More about that in a minute. It also gave immunity for smallpox. It was a mild infection in humans. You'd get a little rash on your hands. It would go away within a week. Very mild and super benign. 
then Jenner had this epiphany. Oh, you know, if we deliberately infect people with cowpox, then maybe we can have a more safe way to keep people from getting smallpox. He tried it. It worked. And this gives us vaccination. The Latin word for a female cow is a waka, a V-A-C-C-A. So the word vaccination is originally specific to this one method of preventing smallpox. Uh, a slight note about smallpox immunity, um, it doesn't last forever. If you've had a smallpox vaccine, um, you may not still be immune. Probably it's not an issue, but you may wonder, uh, how can I get cowpox in a pinch? Well, uh, my late night anxiety Googles are years for the taking here. Cowpox is still an actively transmitted animal infection, not in cows, but in voles and other small rodents that live in rural areas adjacent to urban areas in Europe. The main vector by which cowpox is transmitted to humans today is by cats, because the cats eat the voles, the cats get cowpox, and then the cats give cowpox to the humans but it's still a mild infection and it still grants you smallpox immunity. So if you're worried about smallpox and you want to figure out how to make yourself immune, your best bet is to pet every single cat in Europe, North Africa, and Asia. Uh, especially Northern Europe though, Britain and Switzerland, we have the best data for. They seem to be the hot spots for cowpox transmission. So study abroad, pet some kitties, and you may never have to get smallpox. But it's been eradicated, so you probably won't anyway. Worry about something else. Now, I mentioned this phenomenon of Greek sophists. Uh, here's an idea of what these performances may have looked like. On the left is a portrait of one of the most rock star of the rock star sophists. This is Heroides Atticus. And he got so wealthy from traveling around on tour and giving speeches in front of giant crowds of adoring fans that he built his own Odeon, which is a, essentially like a podcast theater because podcasts aren't a thing in the ancient world. So if you wanted to hear somebody give an informational talk or uh, a bit of fan fiction rhetoric, you'd go to one of these purpose-built theaters. So here's one, the one in Athens, built by Herodes Atticus. This would host other events too, including medical lectures and demonstrations. This was a regular way to get medical education, both as a layperson and as an aspiring physician. This was also the way to build your client base. So if you're very good at giving presentations on how medicine works, your practice will grow a little bit like how some doctors grow their practice by having YouTube channels. I'm looking at you, Dr. Pimple Popper. I've mentioned briefly before the patronage system in Rome, but now is a good time to revisit this because this is the way that Galen builds his career. And he becomes, by doing this, an example for the most triumphant way to use patronage to your advantage. Romans ran a lot of their machinery of inclusion through patronage, specifically the citizenship process. And as we noticed on Law Day, having Roman citizenship gives you protections and advantages that you just don't get if you don't have it. But it's not being granted to everybody in the empire. You have to either have been enslaved by a Roman or be sponsored by a Roman. So that path to citizenship meant that many Greek intellectuals, it's not just doctors, poets, engineers, historians, professors, um, entertainers, dancers, musicians, the, the list just goes on and on and on. The way that you would get your citizenship and make your professional connections was by trying to get close to a wealthy Roman and make him your patron. And then you would slowly trade up to increasingly powerful Romans until you, this is the dream, 
get to be the emperor's client, and that's what Galen does. We have here some Victorian fan art of what this process looked like in, in practice. You have this wealthy Roman eating his food, and he's got all of these random folks around his table, including someone who may or may not be his wife. It's hard to tell. And they're hanging on his every word because if he sponsors them, they'll get their citizenship. If he sponsors them, they'll get their professional expenses provided for. They'll get referrals. This is the way that you get paid in exposure in ancient Rome. In fact, under the one person in the kind of mauve rust-colored tunic, there's this musical instrument. That's what that square thing is. That's a lyre, and that tells you that this guy's a professional musician. Let's see, any other professional markers? No, uh, they're all wearing flower crowns because that's what you do at Roman feasts. And then he's got an enslaved person titering his wine. Uh, what this meant in practice was that if you're an upwardly mobile physician, you're going to spend a lot of time just hanging out with wealthy Romans. And you can see this dynamic at play in On Prognosis. Galen talks about his demonstrations and this guy named Boethius who keeps coming to them and seems to be a big Galen fan and Galen name drops him over and over again. You'll notice Galen loves to drop important people's names, including the emperor. We think On Prognosis was written before he was the emperor's physician, so Boethius is uh, at one point one of his Roman patrons and he I think is a senatorial guy. Um, he's part of the upper administration of the imperial court. So Galen talks about doing all of these house calls at Boethius's house. He treats Boethius's wife at one point. He, um, incidentally, the bit of on prognosis where Galen talks about treating Boethius's wife is one of our best sources for how ancient OBGYNs practice, because you'll notice Galen himself isn't looking at Boethius's wife. Rather, her OBGYNs are looking at her. Your translation says midwife, OBGYN is more appropriate. They didn't practice with a medical supervisor. They had their own independent practices. So uh, modern scholars should and increasingly do call them obstetricians. So the obstetricians are doing all of the examining, they're consulting, Galen's listening to them. They're a vital part of the medical landscape in Rome. You also spend a lot of time hanging out socially with these upper class Romans. You're going to be called to entertain their guests, so you might get to do a floor show dissection at a dinner party for all of your wealthy Romans friends and colleagues. You're expected to hang out with them in public, to follow them around, to make them look important, and this was a massive time suck. Another Roman, well, Greek intellectual working inside the Roman world, a uh, sophist named Lucian uh, complains at length about just how invasive this could be. Apparently one of his friends was forced to dog sit for this very poorly house trained lap dog. Yeah, so this could get a little nuts. But this is also the social dy dynamic behind a lot of the stories and on prognosis and something to keep in mind. I'm being super obvious about this because for years scholars would read Galen and they wouldn't take the historical and social context into account. They'd read Galen writing that, oh, all of the other doctors were idiots and they didn't know what to do, but I knew what to do because I am the best doctor. And they would say, oh yes, Galen was hands down the best doctor in Rome because he knew how to fix things and none of the other doctors were competent at all. That's a horrible way to do history, yes? You don't rule unilaterally on whether somebody is competent or not by asking their competitor whether they're competent. That's going to be a really predictable answer there. But this has caused real harm to medical history because Galen is so influential and he's in a context that is so toxic and competitive that for the longest time medical historians didn't bother to look at any of the surviving writings of Methodist physicians because they assumed that everything Galen said was 100% accurate. That when Galen said they were idiots who didn't know what they were doing and you should never hire them, 
they took that at face value. So one of the wide open spaces for modern medical historians is to look at stuff that actual Methodists wrote and to talk about it with the same level of dignity and respect that we do to Galen's writings. Once you have this dynamic in mind, though, on prognosis suddenly becomes a lot more entertaining. So one way you might want to get at this is instead of just reading it quietly to yourself, read it out loud, make a performance out of it, and then uh, do it in your best Dr. House impersonation, if you're familiar with that show. If you're not, this will still make sense. But if you've watched House, then you know the dynamic I'm talking about, right? This know-it-all, all all other doctors are idiots except for me, I'm the best doctor, pick me, pick me, like that. That whole dynamic, including the very abrasive unpleasantness, uh, Galen is a tireless self-promoter, and that's how he got to be who he was. But it also introduces a huge historical problem for us. You've got to be very cautious at what Galen's telling you, because Galen doesn't know that he's a historical source, right? He doesn't know that we're trying to get an accurate sense of medicine in the first century. He just wants you to hire him. And that's the point of on prognosis, is Galen's telling you why he's the only good doctor and you should give him all of your money. So yeah, it is kind of manipulative and sketchy. Now more about doctors in Rome in general. We've touched on this, but now we're going to spend some time with it now that I'm sitting down and info dumping and I don't have to stop talking at a certain point. Sorry, guys, this will take a minute. For general practitioners in Rome, the word is medici or medici, that's the plural. So medici are male identifying doctors, medici are female identifying doctors. And medica, the feminine form of doctor, is used distinctly and separately from their word for um, an obstetrician gynecologist. So this does mean exactly what it looks like it means. This means a woman with a general practice in general medicine. And these women do seem to have treated both men and women of varying social statuses. Now, they aren't like 50-50 common. They're, they're a sizable minority though. We have their tombstones, uh, some of them very nice tombstones that must have cost a lot of money to build. And we have dedicated inscriptions from lady doctors who built public buildings for their town, who were donors to the library, who paid for gladiatorial competitions. So these practitioners, both male and female, are economic powerhouses, especially in smaller towns. And this is not just a big city thing. In big cities, we tend to see many of them working together in uh, group practices or collaborative situations, but also vying with each other. Now, they don't seem to be giving anatomical demonstrations, so they're not doing that kind of super competitive performing of medicine that Galen and his buddies do. Probably because the demand is high, but also because of gendered expectations. It wouldn't have been considered acceptable for a woman to do that. Now we do know, however, that some women did teach classes in medicine. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not giving informational lectures, it's just not as um, toxic, as vital. And there are also ways of getting patients that are open to female physicians that aren't to men, and that's through women's social networks, which operated semi-independently of male social networks in the ancient Mediterranean, and which were large parts of the medical economy. Roman women were independently wealthy. They could inherit property, they could run businesses, and as such, they tended to sponsor female physicians. But it's not just women who care about women's writing. As I mentioned, Pliny the Elder uses medical research written by women, and he's not weird about it, right? He doesn't spend a lot of time going like, oh, even though she's a woman, I will grudgingly quote her. No, he's like, 
oh, yeah, and so Tira says that blah blah blah, and then he'll go right back to talking about a dude physician exactly the same way. Oh, God, I love Pliny. <clears throat> right. That is your standard word for a doctor, and most of your doctors are going to be one of these general folks. Uh, general practice, if you're not familiar, means that you do a lot of frontline medicine. So you're seeing patients on a regular basis, you're primarily responsible for their cases, and you don't specialize in certain kinds of procedures or body parts. One of the ways that you could get to be a medicus was through the military. We touched on this briefly during the Roman law section. One of the ways that doctors were recruited and retained by the Roman military was through perks. So unlike regular soldiers, if you were a doctor, you could sign up for a five-year tour, and when you were discharged, you could expect to have your citizenship. So it's a way of bypassing patronage. While you are working for the Roman army, you cannot be sued for anything or in any way. So it's also your get-out-of-lawsuits-free card. This meant that the Roman army was able to recruit and maintain a pretty hefty number of physicians, and we'll talk about how this impacted military infrastructure later. But for doctors who were going into medicine, this may, meant that if you wanted to get training, you could also do this through the military, because they're not just recruiting active doctors, but they're taking people who are already in the military and training them to act as frontline medics. So this is the beginning ish. We have evidence of uh, first aid medics embedded with units since uh, the Trojan War, which is Greek Dark Age poetry. So this is not invented in this period. But this is where the Roman army starts to systematically make sure that every eunuch has a medicus, a, a medic, and that these medici have supplies and uh, some releases from duties so that they can practice medicine in the field. And when these folks retire, they talk about their military medicus career as the basis for their new practice. So this is a great jump start to a career. However, if you enter the army as a regular recruit, you're going to be there for 20 to 25 years. And that means that by the time you get to start your practice, you're in your 40s, 50s. 30s if you joined really, really early, which some people did. Specialists were a thing in ancient Rome, and they have been for some time. We see them in Greece, too. Some of the treatises in the Hippocratic Corpus are specialty treatises. We're going to read on fractures. We already read regimen and acute illnesses. Specialists tended to concentrate around body parts. So ocularii are eye doctors. It's just Latin for eye doctor. Uh, you had people who specialized in hemorrhoid repair, in obstetrics and gynecology. This was a majority, if not exclusively, female bit of the profession. You had people who would only do one kind of surgery. So stone cutting could be your whole practice. Um, also, eye surgery could be your whole practice. We see specializations not just in medicine for human people, but also for animal people, too. Veterinarians are a regular part of the Roman medical marketplace, and they tend to get hired by institutions in Rome that keep a variety of animals. So zoo collections, private preserves, uh, arenas, because arenas regularly used wild animals as part of the entertainment, but also uh, chariot racing, so you could be the veterinarian for the chariot team. Veterinarians do really well, and we have a surviving veterinary medicine pamphlet. The next thing where we have a large active population is retail pharmacy. Now, in days before urbanization became uh, larger and more prevalent in the Mediterranean, pharmacy was folded into your general medical practice. You would be expected to gather your own medications to compound them and then to sell them or give them to your patients yourself. But by the time we get into the Roman period, 
And indeed, for a long time, there had been a division between practice of pharmacy, especially the gathering supply end of pharmacy, and practice of medicine, because it quickly became impractical to hold down a medical practice and to spend all the time wandering through the woods looking for your pharmaceutical stock. So what starts happening under Rome is that this is further divided into what I call retail pharmacy, where you had the pharmacist running the storefront, who is often a compounding pharmacist. They're mixing remedies, they're selling them in final compound form, they're keeping stock on hand, but they themselves aren't gathering the medications, although there's evidence that they might grow a little bit of their own supply. But they're relying primarily on yet another specialty, often called root cutters. These are wild gatherers who hunter gather medical ingredients, sell them to the retail pharmacist who then compounds them, packages them, and sells them for physicians. Now, some physicians would buy the ingredients and then compound their own remedies, and this led to some massive trouble in urban medicine. Uh, we know about this because Galen complains at length about how hard it was to tell if the item that you bought was the right item. Plants got mislabeled, the plants hadn't been preserved correctly, uh, some minerals are substituted for other minerals that look the same but they're cheaper. This happened a lot with cinnabar, which looks like red iron oxide, but it's, we now know carcinogenic, but it's also poisonous. It's a byproduct of volcanism. And in Italy, it was much easier to get a hold of because Italy is a volcanic hotspot, um, as per my previous slide about Mount Vesuvius. This meant that uh, when we go to the pharmacy chapter, chapter section, what are we calling this? Uh, the unit on ancient pharmacy. Some of what we're going to be talking about and reading about is how to spot fake product. This continued to be a problem in pharmacy right on into the 20th century, and it's still a problem. Um, one of the more recent scandals about herbal remedies in retail pharmacies. Uh, someone tested the contents of different brands of herbal remedies and found that the plants in the pills weren't the plants that were advertised on the bottle. This is something that the FDA really struggles to regulate. And this is why if you do find yourself using traditional medicine, it's very important to buy things that have been packaged and labeled through a reputable supplier that has done the work to ensure that what you're buying is what you're getting in the doses that you're getting. Because not all natural remedies are, but not just because it's natural doesn't mean it won't kill you. Natural things can totally kill you. They do actual things to your body. Uh, side note, for safety reasons, just so I don't forget to do it in the pharmacy lecture, St. John's wort can counter the effects of birth control pills. I'm sure you know what to do with this information. But if you didn't know, now you know. Um, you can totally check it up on Google and I think Google will agree with me. All right. The retail pharmacists are sometimes called pigmentarii, which threw scholars off the track for a while because it means dye seller. And you may wonder why your supplier for dyes is also your supplier for pharmacies. Well, the same minerals, particularly minerals, but also plants that are used for dyeing are also drug items. And if you're already selling them, you want to expand your market share. So often the same person who was selling um, hair dye, cloth dye, wool dye, was also selling pharmacies. For that reason, when they're mentioned in legal writings or on tombstones, sometimes they'll call themselves a pharmacopolis, which means a drug seller. Sometimes you'll see pigmentarius, which means pigment seller. They're a very similar profession. Finally, the Roman Empire institutes some regulation of the medical marketplace. Now, this is not licensing. Uh, never does Rome go in for medical licensing because it's impractical and impossible without agreed upon standards for how bodies work. It's very hard to write the MCATs if you're still not sure if people have humors or pores and passages. 
but because of lobbying and regulatory problems across the empire in which local communities had trouble getting their prominent physicians um, work releases so that they didn't have to do certain services as part of their municipal service. In other words, cities under Rome would often finance themselves and do their local taxes by having a list of the wealthy citizens, and then wealthy citizens would be randomly asked to buy stuff for the city-state that year. So either to fund part of their tribute that would be sent back to Rome, to pay for a new ship for the Navy, to pay for the streets to be cleaned. So there's this whole laundry list of things you could be asked to do, including time-consuming services. But if you have a medical practice, you're already serving the community. And you don't have the time to drop everything and go help put on a play, which is one of the things you could end up doing, was you could be tapped to be part of the play committee that year. So certain physicians were given the right of immunity to both paying taxes and to giving service in time donated to the state. These physicians were called, in some places, the archaeatry. So sometimes you'll see this word. It looks like it's a dinosaur, it's not. It just means a chief physician or a principal physician. There were a certain number of slots in each town or city, and the number of slots differed depending on your population. So large populations, I think it's like 10 maximum archaeotry. In smaller towns, it would be five. And you would get to be one of these chief physicians because your town would vote for you. And this didn't have a whole lot of restrictions to it in terms of specialties. Uh, Roman law has a section about this, which is how we know. If you, they drew the line at people who were dream interpreters or faith healers or practicing some kind of supernatural healing. Rather, you had to be doing some kind of rationalizing medical practice. So this is the final triumph of the Hippocratics and their brand of medicine, is that this gets to be the kind of medicine that gets legal recognition. However, if you were a specialist, right, if you were an eye specialist or a surgical specialist or sometimes even a pharmacist, you could be on the list. Similarly, if you were an obstetrician, you could get on the list too. Now, because women weren't necessarily liable for certain civic duties, uh, particularly military service duties. Most of the people who get picked for this are male, but there's some women who effectively rise to this place. And the fact that obstetricians are included in the list when we look at municipal privileges means that women get recognized for this too. So it's a period where um, you get more parity in women versus men practitioners than you do until the 1970s, even. About that, the name in Greek for an OBGYN is a Maya. Maya is the plural. And often that's translated midwife, as I said before. I'm going to call it an obstetrician. We get the word obstetrician from the Latin word obstetriques is the plural, obstetrix is the singular. These are both the same word, just my eyes Greek, obstetriques is Latin. And this was the go-to profession for women in medicine, uh, but not the only one. We're looking now on the right at the tombstone for a woman medica who was practicing in Gaul, so this is southern France. Unfortunately, the tombstone is pretty damaged. We don't have a lot of the inscription, but we do have for us the important part there at the top above her head. You can see where it has any, so we're missing the beginning of the name. Phil means Philia, the daughter. So likely her name was at the top. Um, it said whose daughter she is and then Medica, her profession right there. And this is not the only one. Sometimes women specialized both in general practice and in OBGYN practice, and then they would list both 
professions on their tombstones. So we get people who bill themselves as obstetrics et medica, both an obstetrician and a medica. On the left, we have the tombstone of a physician whose name is known. Her name is Scribonia Attike. Her husband was a surgeon. We have his tombstone too. They're right next to each other in ancient Ostia. And here she's delivering a baby with an attendant. Her name Attike means from Attica, from the area around Athens. She was either an immigrant or more likely had been at one point enslaved and was now a freed woman. She herself owned enslaved people and they were buried in this tomb along with her, as well as some people who may have been her apprentices. Also her spouse's apprentices are up there too. So this could become a family business and often did. One of the ways that women would get into medicine is that their parent is a physician of some kind, um, either mother or father. So that said, that isn't the only way that you could get to be a woman in medicine. We have records of rather depressingly enslaved women being sent to go to obstetrician school because that made them more valuable to their enslavers. Less depressingly, independently wealthy women who weren't necessarily from the upper class, it was felt to be undignified for a very upper class Roman or Greek woman to have an obstetrical practice, although we do know of some who did. Interestingly enough, uh, Socrates, like that Socrates, his mom, she was an obstetrician gynecologist. So even in the 5th century BCE, this rule does get broken sometimes. Among upper class Romans, it was considered undignified for anyone to practice medicine because you had to touch other people's pee and urine and they felt that was undignified and kind of gross. And also you had to speak Greek and they felt that was inappropriate. But if you're not a one percenter in the ancient Greek and Roman world, but you do have enough money to travel some and to invest in your education, one way that you could develop professional skills was by going into medicine, women's medicine especially. This was also one of the ways that you could make a successful immigrant move from your hometown into another part of the world. In Pompeii, one of the neighborhoods has a house where there are a large number of artifacts from Egypt and then a large number of medical instruments, including obstetrician's instruments. So we're going to look at these a bit later, but vaginal speculums are there, uh, other instruments that were used for uh, various pelvic surgeries for women. Um, there are a few that are just general surgical tools, a lot of them with decoration that calls back to Egypt. What we think is going on in this part of Pompeii is that we have a community of immigrant Egyptian physicians who have moved closer to Rome to capitalize on the upper class practice that you get in the resort towns of Baiae and Stabiae. Pompeii too is a bit of a resort town. Unfortunately, they all died in a volcanic eruption, but until that point, they seem to have had a really successful immigration. And I think that, I'm not sure what it says, but it's interesting to me that we see the same pattern too in modern medicine. Medicine in the United States and elsewhere does tend to be a high immigrant sector of the economy, especially hospitalists and uh, some general practitioners. Like uh, my GP is from um, Peru, and let's see, the uh, the obstetrician who saved my life was originally from Ethiopia. This is still a dynamic, and especially if you're in a culture that isn't always kind to immigrants, it's a way that you can gain trust, but still at some risk. Among these immigrants is Galen, which is why this is relevant. These are all of Galen's contemporaries and his competition, not so much the obstetricians, but anybody else on this list, Galen is ready to fight them. If you've done the reading, you know what I mean. All right, so on to career advancement. Self-promotion is the watchword here. 
you not only want to engage in educational activities as an ancient doctor, but you want to make sure that they're verifiable. Now, one of the ways that Rome dealt with a world in which there isn't a licensing board was by routinely investigating the background of the physicians they're hiring. Upper class Roman patients wanted referrals and often did get referrals by writing to areas that were known to be rather medically dense, um, dense in terms of like lots of doctors, not their dense. Um, we know the Emperor Nero was particularly fond of Egyptian physicians, and he regularly recruited them from Egypt by writing and asking if they had any promising local doctors who wanted to move to Rome. What this means for you, the ancient medical student, is that if you had the money, you would study abroad. Study abroad didn't have to be too far away. If you lived close to a large urban center, you would be able to move into that city and attach yourself to one of the local physicians and gain your experiential learning that way. But if you're like Galen, Galen's father was very wealthy. He had a decent nest egg to work with. So he first used that to get himself apprenticed in his hometown Pergamon, which is already, as we mentioned earlier, a magnet place for doctors and healers. It's a large temple to Asclepius, and it's a regular place people went for study abroad. But Galen wanted a little bit more credentialing than that, so he moved to Alexandria in Egypt, which, like Pergamon, was still a medical center. It didn't have a traditional medical school in the way we think of them as you know, educational institutions, but through the library, it was a place where you could see lectures and attend uh, bedside visits staffed by the most reputable physicians of the age. Galen then moves back home, and this brings us to our next bullet point. So after he's done with his study abroad, he gets his first job out of med school through nepotism. Remember, his father was a wealthy guy in Pergamon. His father still had a lot of uh, friends and connections. And through these connections, Galen gets one of the best jobs you can get as a young surgeon. And that is as doctor for the local arena. So he was a gladiator doctor. His first specialty was in ancient sports medicine. And during his tenure as doctor for the gladiators, he kept stats on how many people lived. And again, we can't verify this because it's been a minute. But we know these numbers because Galen brags about them. In his first year, none of the gladiators died. And I think in the course of his entire career as a gladiatorial physician, like only two, three people died. Now, this has been used as a way to push back on popular conceptions of gladiators as people with very short life expectancies. Uh, that's true to a point. We now know that for high profile gladiators, you weren't regularly expecting to die when you went to the to the arena. It would happen occasionally, but most high profile named famous gladiators got out alive. But if you're in the provinces, the farther you are from big cities, and also the lower value as an enslaved person you are, because gladiators were mostly enslaved, the more frequently you would be prone to die. But because your body has a lot of monetary value, you're a trained professional athlete, it was felt to be important enough that you get state-sponsored health care that the state would hire you a doctor. So these gladiators got Galen. For others, as I said previously, not however for Galen, it seems, you would go off and treat soldiers, and then that would be how you built your reputation and also how you got your training. Galen mentions in anatomical procedures other places where you can get medical knowledge. First, soldiers. He says if you're near and around soldiers, you'll see a lot of traumatic injuries, and traumatic injuries are a great opportunity to kind of poke around and see what's there. Again, opportunistic vivisection was considered to be ethical at this point. He also mentions roadside casualties, and this is something that it's important to point out because I've made it sound like travel was safer, and it was safer than it had been in ever, but it wasn't safe. 
if you weren't traveling in a large group, and even if you were, you would regularly expect to be attacked by people who had been exiled from their home cities or who just preyed upon travelers in order to enslave them, traffic them, or then kill them for their stuff. Roadside muggings were super common. And you've probably heard a Roman roadside mugging story, although you may not have made the connection. If you've read the New Testament, one of the parables recorded and attributed to Jesus starts off with this premise that, okay, so there is this dude traveling on the road, and he's set upon by bandits, and he's bleeding by the side of the road, he's not doing well, and then these two different people, I think it's like, um, a Levite and a wealthy man walk by him and then they, they won't touch him, they won't treat him because, you know, it might not be safe, who knows where he's from, maybe he's a bandit. And then finally there's the Samaritan who's like, oh my god, you're bleeding out, I'm going to do something about this. And he takes him and gets him a doctor. This was a relatable story because getting beat up on the road was such a normal part of ancient life. And we see this in Galen, one of the suggestions he makes, if you want to see human anatomy in actual humans, you need to hang out along the roadside and then look for the bodies of people who have deceased, check around to make sure they're not related to anyone, and then you can dissect them. And he talks about doing this with a, a very advanced decomposed body, but he finds this body by the side with the road, he asks the locals and they're like, oh yeah, that's that's a bandit, that's probably a bandit. And then Galen takes the body and he uses it to map out human skeletons. He also talks about this one time the, the river Tiber floods and then washes out an embankment and then there are these bodies that are floating out of their graves, including some skeletons that have decomposed enough that it's just the skeleton had to, held together by ligaments and tendons. And Galen talks perfectly happily about how he nabs up one of these bodies and uses it to get some anatomical knowledge. So one final way that you can both promote yourself and learn about anatomy is by attending these anatomical demonstrations and giving them yourself if you know you're really com confident about your skills. All of these together form the methods by which you would get your medical education in the Roman world. Uh, a combination of serendipity, of service, of social networking. But it's important to keep in mind because casual historians of the ancient world, or casual medical historians who don't spend a lot of time in the ancient world will say, oh gosh, you know, Roman medicine was the Wild West. There was no way to tell if your doctor sucked or not. Um, that's not untrue. In fact, Galen himself complains about it. But we should pause because Galen saying that all other doctors suck cannot be taken as a factual statement. Yes, he's telling his prospective employers and patients all other doctors suck. That context is everything for that statement. But also, the reality we see on the ground amongst Roman patients is that they're regularly asking, well, who was your teacher? Where did you train? Can I talk to your other patients? And then finally, there's this other phenomenon that I think is in a slide coming up, so I'll hold it for a minute. Ah, yes, because first we've got to talk about cadaver dissection some more. I said it before and I will say it again because this is one of the biggest myths about medicine in the ancient world. There was no law against cadaver dissection. Some people did it, some people didn't, some doctors thought it was ethical, some doctors thought it wasn't, some doctors found it difficult to get a hold of acceptable human bodies, but Galen himself, when he's talking about situations in which you might get a cadaver, lists the following as probable ways that you can go and find your bodies. Human skeletons, uh, Germans killed in battle, victims in the arena, so if your gladiators don't live, you can still poke at them. But also remember, the arena was a place of public execution, and Romans were executing a lot of people. One of the ways that people would be given the death penalty in ancient Rome was to be put into an arena with a lot of spectators and some wild animals and or other prisoners who 
who would then proceed to kill each other. And then the bodies at the end could be claimed by the family, but if they weren't claimed by the family, well then, on you go. Um, we talked about the brigand issue, so there's that. And then, as I said earlier, very depressingly, um, dead children and babies whose bodies haven't been buried. Now, most infant bodies would have been buried because there was this belief that if a magical practitioner stole your dead baby's body, they could use it for sorcery and necromancy. But not everybody had access to burial facilities. There are a lot of homeless people in ancient Rome. There are a lot of enslaved people who are owned by shitty, shitty people. And this all leads to a culture in which uh, trash heaps that are not cleaned regularly in very messy city streets, you might find dead children. It's just a depressing reality of ancient city lives. Uh, but then also this opportunistic vivisection thing. Weirdly, you have more options here. He talks about the victims of anthrax. I'm not going to repeat myself there. Go back a couple slides if you forgot. People with extensive traumatic wounds, especially like limb wounds where you can see tendons and ligaments really well. And then you can also, Galen suggests, observe the effects on the body of having things cut. You know, he points out that you can tell that the spinal cord is really important in movement and transmitting pain because when the injury is actually in the spine, the patient will feel the symptoms in a limb, either with numbness or a loss of function. And then he goes on to use uh, live animals to prove this, which is just distressing. Uh, finally, there's the wounded gladiator thing. I don't think I need to belabor that. This passage is in the reading I've given you from Anatomical Procedures. So I've put the reading title up here on the slide so you know what reading goes with this slide. Now, as I mentioned, uh, cadaver dissection has a bit of a checkered recent history in medicine. Is Recently, as the early 1900s, there weren't a lot of ethical guidelines about how you should treat the human being whose body you were using to learn anatomy. And this resulted in activities like the one we're looking at here, which is a mild manifestation of some really creepy shenanigans, where medical students would routinely pose with their cadaver they would make jokes about the cadaver, they'd use it in pranks, they'd you know, take body parts and scare their relatives with it, all of which is a very shitty way to treat the body of the person who is teaching you human anatomy. But these bodies were regularly sourced from patient populations who were the least able to defend their human rights. So poor people, homeless people, uh, people without family connections, people who were mentally ill, people with developmental disabilities, uh, people who came from other countries with high poverty rates. Under colonialism, one of the regular sources of cadaver bodies and display skeletons were imperial possessions with high poverty rates where the colonizers would use their position of power to buy human remains. This happened in Egypt where mummies were bought by the pound and then were used uh, ground up in compound medication. So this goes to a very dark place very quickly. We now have robust legislation that keeps the majority of these shenanigans in check. However, we still do routinely source our cadavers from populations that don't have great access to rights protection. So unidentified people are sometimes used as cadavers. Um, the kinds of people who donate their bodies often do so because they can't afford a funeral. 
funerals are ridiculously expensive and we've created a legislative framework that makes it difficult to bury your dead relatives in a an affordable fashion um, this is something that i think we should hold with us when we consider the ethical impact of medical education today people have proposed and started to work on virtual reality ways of learning human anatomy um, dissection alternatives some of which can be robust and very useful because a cadaver will teach you how one human body works but there are small differences in the location of structures the way they lie how they look in a live patient versus your cadaver virtual cadaver dissection also allows you to put things back so you can go do it again until you do it properly my mother has this story about when she was in med school she had to do it as a group project with this other med student and they really didn't get along they had very different opinions about how best to dissect things or how they want to preserve structures or how much time they think it should take so what they ended up doing was drawing a line down the middle of their cadaver and splitting structures of which there were one like the heart they had a big fight over the heart apparently if everybody could have their own VR cadaver then maybe we wouldn't have to do that again I'm not saying that cadaver dissection is not useful it is we've learned a lot from cadavers and part of our medical universe in which we can expect to survive major illnesses and uh, have surgical alternatives to repair truly catastrophic injuries and malformations is because of the very great service cadaver bodies have played in medical education it's a persistent problem because it is such a useful way to train people I don't have great solutions here. It's just important to think about it a bit. Now, back to ancient Rome, we need to talk a bit about how this impacted practice conditions. And to do that, we're looking at a poem by Marshall, who's not writing about medicine mostly, but he is writing a little bit about medicine. He is an epigrammatist, uh, that is, a poet who's writing funny short satirical poems about stuff that irritates him this particular one is dedicated to his doctor and it's framing for us a treatment situation that would have been really familiar to Roman patients the poem goes and pardon me I'll just narrate this for you I was ill but you came immediately to me Symmachus surrounded by a hundred students a hundred hands frozen by the north wind touched me i didn't have a fever simicus but now i do this is a world without germ theory yes they don't know how disease is transmitted for marshall he thinks that a bunch of cold hands touching him can give him a fever um, even by ancient medical logic that one doesn't really check out but the situation that he's using as this relatable punchline does point to one of the problems in Roman healthcare. Namely, because you learn your medical education in an apprenticeship, and because you develop your practice by going to other people's doctor's appointments, essentially. So when you, upper class Roman person, had your doctor pay a house call you'd often and routinely invite your friends to go watch you would do this both so you'd have witnesses in case something went wrong but also your doctor expected you to have all of your friends there so your friends could see what a great doctor you are this is going on in Galen's on prognosis you may have noticed that there are all of these stories Galen tells where he just shows up at some other doctor's house call and then waits until things go really really wrong to swoop in and be an absolute raging dick to point out what the other guy's doing wrong and then to himself take over the patient and then fix the patient 
that's what Marshall is complaining about here, is that your ancient sickbed would be really super crowded and would be a source of entertainment for your friends. As we are all aware, social distancing saves lives. This is a horrible way to run your healthcare vetting process. So ancient Roman sickbeds were a place where disease was routinely transmitted, incubated, and then passed on. It is no coincidence that Galen is practicing medicine at a time where an epidemic disease is raging out of control through the streets of Rome. Galen is aware of this, by the way. This is at the beginning of On Prognosis, but you'll kind of miss it if you're reading very, very quickly. Galen talks about how there's a plague going on at the border. Um, he's telling stories that date to the time of the emperor Antoninus Pius. This is before Marcus Aurelius hires him. It's one of the early works of Galen. He talks about how like, he was really worried that if he stuck around in town, somebody would make him go to the border and be in the entourage that treats plague victims. So he socially distances himself from the plague by leaving town. I'm pointing this out because I've seen a meme making its way through the social medias where people are saying, um, you know, oh, we need doctors like Galen now who don't run away from epidemics. Uh, that is exactly what we do not need. Galen was a major pansy who ran away from the first epidemic disease that crossed his threshold and seems to have done a lot to wiggle out of military plague service. Now, eventually he ends up having to do it once he's working for Marcus Aurelius. But it's an interesting moment, and if you haven't caught it before, look again at the reading and see how Galen spins this. It's really interesting to me that he addresses this, I think because he has to let his audience know that uh, even though he was a wuss and wouldn't stick around for the pandemic, uh, he's still worth your time hiring. I also find it interesting that Galen talks early about uh, how you have to be careful with prognosis. He talks about this guy named Quintus, who seems to have been Galen's instructor in the city of Rome proper. We don't know the rest of the guy's name. Quintus is just a Roman first name. It's like uh, Bob the Doctor, really common name. The only reason we know about him is that Galen studied medicine with him, but apparently he was like, I don't know, Cher, because he just had the one name, you know, Cher, Sting, Quintus. So Quintus the physician apparently had to re leave town really, really fast because he was just so good at prognosis. He was so good at predicting how a disease would turn out that he had to leave town because his rivals accused him of witchcraft. But notice that Galen is also talking about his Jedi Master, yeah. So Galen is saying that, oh, you have to be careful with prognosis, because if you're really good at prognosis, like I am, then people are going to accuse you of being a wizard. But you're not a wizard, you're just a good doctor. And isn't that a great way to spin your medical practice, to be like, Galen of Pergamon, so good you'll think he's a wizard. God, Galen, I, I, he's so entertaining when you start reading him as a completely full of it, shameless, self-serving um, braggart. I say that, but also Galen does seem to have been a very good doctor. I've been harsh on him, but part of why I go for the House MD parallel is that Galen is an asshole, but he's a very competent asshole, which is why even though I find him much less likable than, say, Pliny the Elder, we're still going to spend a lot of time talking about him, because competent assholes are still useful. Indeed, uh, medical history, if it teaches you nothing else, it teaches you how to use the history of medical assholery to promote the spread of knowledge and maybe not have so many jerks. Yeah, that argument got away from me. But I've already recorded too much of this slide, so I'm just going to leave it there. Next. What we're looking at here is often called the House of the Surgeon. It's a house in Pompeii. 
and it's called the House of the Surgeon because of what's in the shop space at uh, the entrance. We're looking at the floor plan from above now. In the areas labeled shop and a few of the, the little bedrooms around the central hallway in this front end of the house, the place where it says entrance is where the street is, and then the entrance into the shop opens into this atrium with beds and wings. In this house, we found a really well-preserved set of medical instruments and some medicine chests. What we think is going on in this house is that this is, like a lot of businesses in the Roman world, a combination of private residence and public clinic. This used to be the norm for family practices. Your local doctor would have their house and the front part of their house would also be their clinic. And when you needed treatment, you'd go to your doctor's house, you'd go in, you'd get your treatment. You wouldn't necessarily go to the back of the house, but their family would be upstairs, their dog would be running around in the yard. This was pretty common up until very recently. My parents' first practice in rural West Virginia, deep rural West Virginia, um, Green Bank, if you're familiar with either uh, people who avoid electromagnetic magnetic, um, waves and radio waves, or if you're familiar with radio space astronomy, that was my original hometown, and my parents had their, their clinic near their house, but they'd also let patients stop by their porch sometimes for a, a quick look over. You'll still find this some places it's harder to do now uh, because of some of the requirements of medical records keeping. It also becomes very expensive in terms of insurance overhead. Here is the Roman version of that. Likely, the small beds around the central atrium were used as a place to keep patients. We think this because the doorways are deliberately spaced so that they're not sharing airflow. You see on the left the two bedrooms, one of them opens into a wing, another one opens into the atrium. The atrium space has a ceiling that's open to the sky, so the air circulation would have kept the air from the one bedroom going into the other bedroom. Now there's no ancient germ theory, but they do have this idea that shared air supply has something to do with the spread of disease, like human contact and the air that they're breathing is relevant. They're not necessarily wrong, even though you don't have germ theory. If you were, say, going to put some COVID-19 patients in here, you would have some therapeutic benefit from this air circulation plan. The other bedrooms do connect to each other, but they've also got these external doors. Probably what they're trying to do is maximize fresh air space there. These also might be surgical places. The open air in the atrium area also provides a lot of natural light. You're gonna need this to operate with. This is a picture of the interior where you can see in the corner a, a little shrine. Um, there also, if I remember correctly, there's a little charcoal brazier where you could heat your instruments so that you could cut and cauterize at the same time. We think that Galen at certain points in his career may have had this kind of a shop. He talks about uh, people dropping by his house, but he also talks about making house calls. One of the ways you deal with not having cell phones in antiquity is that you'd have this shop front where your apprentices could see people and keep folks around for when you came back home, but you could also travel to your patients. Because again, there's no germ theory, but you do know that shared air and contact creates a situation that tends to breed more disease. House calls and keeping your patients away from each other is a measure that we see in pre-modern, pre-germ theory healthcare. It's something that gets rediscovered again and again throughout medical history. In fact, during the Revolutionary War, there were some attempts to make hospital spaces that immediately were dismantled because people started dying a lot more and cross-infecting each other. Now, about these medical instruments, here are some from Pompeii. We find them from all over the ancient world. These weren't mass-produced, so each medical instrument had to be made by hand 
and there seemed to be some specialist smithies who would do just medical instruments. Medical instruments were preferentially made of bronze, sometimes silver if you were really fancy, but bronze is the go-to. Most medical instruments we have are bronze. And this after a period during which iron and steel were widely available. Now, things that had to hold a sharp edge for a long time, like surgical scalpels, would have steel blades, but the majority of the basic instrument was made out of bronze, and this is neat for a number of reasons. First, bronze is a copper alloy. Copper alloys have a naturally antimicrobial surface. In the age of antibiotic-resistant pathogens, we've started to use more bronze, brass, copper fittings inside hospital spaces, especially on high-touch surfaces like doorways. What happens is that the copper in the surface creates a very uh, low-grade electrical charge that physically disrupts the structures of pathogens, both viruses and bacilli. Now, Romans don't know any of this. They have no microscopes, but they do have a lot of bronze. Bronze is a go-to metal in the ancient world. It doesn't rust, which means that if you're constantly bleeding on the medical instrument, it's not going to make it rust and get all like gnarly. The only place where steel is going to be an advantage is things that need blades. But for medical instruments that are getting wet all the time, like they're, they're getting snot, blood, water. Roman physicians also did wash their instruments, not just with water, but they would regularly heat them over coals. Now this, again, wasn't because they knew about germ theory, but they realized that if you heat a blade and you cut your patient while the blade is hot, it cauterizes the wound and cuts down on bleeding more about that when we get to ancient surgery. So silver, by the way, I don't have this listed. Silver also is antimicrobial, but only if it's in contact with water. This is fine for medical instruments. Bronze is a better choice, but fancy doctors would have silver instruments sometimes. It is very likely, although we cannot prove it, that the preference for bronze instruments grew out of an observation on the ground that patients treated with bronze instruments had better outcomes. That said, it might just be a happy accident. The good news here is that your ancient Roman doctor isn't going to give you as many secondary, edu secondary infections as you think they are. Your Roman doctor has a pretty good chance of giving you decently safe surgery for a pre-modern context. And cleanliness standards amongst ancient Romans also helped this a little bit. Um, doctors weren't, as they were in, say, the Victorian period, routinely wearing blood-stained outfits to show off that they were extra good doctors. That's not a thing for Romans. Romans keep it reasonably clean. Or reasonably, um, don't expect miracles. It does get gnarly in other ways that we'll explore during pharmacy week. Here are a few more medical instruments. These are all from a silver collection. You can see here a variety of probes and spatulas. One of the other bits of good news, we'll unpack this more in pharmacy week, is that medications weren't being applied with the doctor's hand on the patient's body but using applicators that were made out of bronze or copper. This likely reduced the amount of disease transmission, and it also creates a barrier where you're not putting your hand on the patient's body and then putting your hand on your face. Accident, very likely, but we're accidentally making good choices for our patients here. Is this, ah yes, my last Galen story. Well, Galen context story. Something that comes up in Galen's writing, and I I don't remember, I think this is in on prognosis. This might be in your supplementary reading. I gave you an optional one, which is called On Methods by Which the Best Physicians Are Known. Very wordy title. It's a Galen treatise that survives only in Arabic translation. 
it's very similar to on prognosis, which is why I made it optional. It's basically Galen telling you a bunch of stories about why Galen is awesome. This treatise never tells you how to recognize the best physician. It basically tells you how to recognize Galen is what it is. So it's a very unsubtle infomercial. In the same way on prognosis, right? Pro on prognosis gives you very little practical advice for how to make a prognosis. What on prognosis gives you is a lot of stories about why you should hire Galen. Back to the love thing. Ancient physicians had an idea that romantic love and also physical lust, uh, they didn't necessarily differentiate between romantic love and sexual attraction. So this is a very fuzzy category for Romans. Romans believed that having um, intense sexual feelings and perhaps also intense romantic feelings for someone, if unrequited, could kill you. They believed that it would cause you to forget to eat, your body wouldn't absorb nutrition, they believed it would then weaken you and eventually cause you to sicken and then die. So this whole dying because of love or of a broken heart thing that's still a bit of a cultural myth that we refer to all the time despite not believing in it, mostly. Broken heart syndrome is a thing. But generally speaking, we no longer think you're going to die from unrequited lust. But for ancient people, they really did believe you could die from unrequited lust. It was one of the ways by which doctors would regularly show that they were excellent doctors. We know this because it's not just Galen who has a story about diagnosing love. We have stories about Erisistratus, about Herophilus doing this. There are these late stories about how Hippocrates did this too. This tends to be what we call a set piece or um, it's a story that people tell to demonstrate that a doctor is a good doctor, kind of like an urban legend. So we know about this with Galen because Galen tells the story about himself where he's checking on someone's wife who has not been doing well. She's not eating, she's pale, she's pining, and then he's taking her pulse when this particularly hot enslaved guy walks into the room. And at this point, Galen, with absolutely no regard for the Hippocratic Oath I might mention, which is more evidence that the Hippocratic Oath isn't actually something that people are following in antiquity, he then tells the woman's husband, oh, I have diagnosed her problem. She has a terminal case of love for this enslaved person. And then apparently, uh, if I remember this version of the story correctly, the enslaved person is killed and that's the end of that. Uh, Galen's not very interested in whether or not she got better or not. He's telling this story because one of the ways you showed that you were a good doctor is that you can find out things about a patient that the patient will not tell you. Like for instance, you are in love with a person who is going to be murdered if your husband finds out you're in love with them. Galen is such a douche sometimes, like often, many of the times. Uh, again, why I go for the Dr. House thing. That, in a nutshell, is Galen in his context. In his context, he's just one of many struggling doctors who happens to make it to the big time. He gets a great patron, his works get copied. In fact, his library burns down at one point and he has to rewrite all of his books, but he's got enough time to do this. He also has this army of apprentices and enslaved folks who are helping him to be this productive. He's one of the winners in medical history here. He's also ideally positioned to get his reputation cemented, passed down, to where he continues to be a household name long after he was current. But he's also a wrecking ball in medical history in my period. One of the frustrating scholarly problems that I have to cope with on, a, well, I'd say daily basis, but I don't have a lot of time to do research every single day, even now, actually I have a lot less time for research right now, is that 
Galen is our only source for a lot of information, but he is a really biased source. He habitually puts down other doctors, other sources. He only tells us about some sources and not other sources. He creates this problem that only compounds itself in the Middle Ages, because in the Middle Ages, people are reading Galen and they're thinking, oh, Galen is the best doctor. Look, he says so himself. And wow, he really writes about a lot of stuff. Galen must be the best doctor. So why do we need to copy down all of this other stuff when we have Galen? And so after a while, people stop copying down Herophilus, Erisistratus, um, Serranus when he's not writing about gynecology, because they've got Galen. Why do they need these other works? What This happens with Aristotle, too, because Aristotle is a very convenient person to assign for readings in college courses uh, in the Middle Ages. Aristotle gets to be the go-to textbook. So people read Aristotle, they think he's the spokesperson for ancient Greek science, when in fact he's representing a very early stage of Greek science, especially medical science, a stage that ancient research itself improves on and moves away from. So people get this idea that all Roman doctors are Galen and that all Greek science is Aristotle, but it's not. There are hundreds and hundreds of names, and these are just the names that we have. Imagine if the entire corpus of PubMed, you only had the work of like five authors survive, and of those five authors, only two of them we have a relatively complete publication list from. And then you get some sense of the frustration that comes from being a historian of that period. Galen is not only a victim of his own success, but he's also a perpetrator of massive erasures to our picture of healthcare in the ancient world. Now, I don't want you to go away thinking that Roman doctors were freaking geniuses and outcomes were amazing. This is not a medical world I would like to go back to. But from what information we do have and have managed to reconstruct, the ancient world had an active research environment. Doctors were working on improving their knowledge and they were doing a pretty good job of updating their sources as they went on, as new information became available. Periods of stability produced periods of medical exchange, periods where many different doctors from many different parts of the empire were able to talk to each other and collaborate, produced amazing works of scientific advance. So if you take no other lesson from the life of Galen, it's that exchange, plurality, cooperation, and lively debate create better health outcomes. Now, granted, I don't think you should challenge your other med student friends to a dissection duel, but talking to people who aren't like you, making friends with people whose knowledge base doesn't come from the same part of the world as yours does, that is the best thing you can do, not just for yourself, but for the entire collection of humanity. And as we're living through this difficult and weird moment in our own history, I, I like to think about that a lot. As someone who spent a lot of her adult life thinking about epidemics and plagues and how I would react if I were in the middle of one. We have that knowledge. We have this opportunity to take what we've learned in the years between 1918 and today and to use that to petition for greater social distancing, to push back at a government that isn't willing to close down uh, businesses that really shouldn't be open. Uh, we have the opportunity to help other people to socially isolate themselves, to check in on our chronically ill friends. We just have such a chance to save lives today. And that is my takeaway here. We're in a time where every one of us gets to choose to be a hero. Um, 
is do your best. Your best is probably going to be better than an ancient Roman dude. And if you're doing better than an ancient Roman dude, pat yourself on the back, because a lot of modern people don't rise to that standard. Take care. Be well. Stay classy. I love you all. Let me know how things are going. Take care of your folks. You're very much in my thoughts. Later, guys.